Okay, welcome back everyone. Section two. Thanks. Very much. Thank you, Frederick. Um, okay. So picking up where we left off. So we introduced the PC algorithm as a kind of schematic for for learning a equivalence class of graphs. And we said that uh, in, in like looking in terms of the kind of pseudocode, uh, you plug in some conditional independence test and some significance level uh, alpha in order to make your judgments of conditional independence. So what does that look like? So it's important to emphasize that at least in the kind of classic PC, um, the way the independence test is formulated is that the null hypothesis is conditional independence. And so in statistical hypothesis testing, you decide whether you reject the null, right? So if I observe a test statistic that uh, say it's like the partial correlation, which we'll talk about in a second, the partial correlation is very small, then I reject the null hypothesis of independence. And that means that I keep the edge. I fail to remove the edge. And if I don't reject the null hypothesis, then that means I'm effectively accepting the null of conditional independence, which means I do remove the edge. So what this leads to is the fact uh, is the conclusion that alpha, the significance threshold, is something that's going to control the sparsity of the graph that you learn in the end. As alpha gets smaller, it becomes harder and harder to retain an edge. So you're more likely to remove an edge. And so the graph gets sparser. The alpha bigger means a denser graph. So um, and and because you're doing many, many hypothesis tests of conditional independence. Uh, alpha by itself doesn't have a straightforward interpretation in terms of the type one error um, of the tests because you're doing this multiple tests and, uh, and the number of tests kind of varies as you perform the algorithm. So that's why alpha is often thought of as this kind of tuning parameter, which controls the sparsity of the estimated graph. And as was brought up earlier, there are ways of choosing alpha uh, in a kind of more deliberate fashion rather than setting alpha to some fixed, uh, fixed level ahead of time in a way that might control something like a family-wise error rate or a false discovery rate by using some sort of bound over the number of tests that you perform. Um, and I can go back to stuff talking about choosing alpha later on. So what statistical independence test would you use? So that depends on the family of distributions P of X that you're willing to assume. So if you're willing to assume that P of X is in some nice parametric family, for example, Gaussian distributions or multinomial distributions, if things are uh, uh, discrete, then life is easier because there's a lot of good statistical tests for independence in Gaussians or independence in a multinomial. Uh, however, there's also a kind of, one thing that makes an algorithm like PC and related constraint-based methods continuously relevant, even in the age of like much better algorithms for certain purposes, is that you can be as non-parametric as you want to be, at least in principle. So if I plug in a non-parametric conditional independence test that has satisfies certain properties, I, I make no parametric assumptions in the course of PC itself, right? Everything phrased in PC is in terms of conditional independence, which is this non-parametric concept. And I can implement it using non-parametric tests if I so choose. So first consider uh, the case where X is Gaussian, uh, in, which is a kind of common setting. In that case, uh, conditional independence just corresponds to partial correlation being zero. The partial correlation, which I'm going to denote with a row ij dot s, so the partial correlation between xi and xj given s, um, is uh, you can define this way. This is a kind of recursive definition of partial correlation, which says that for a conditioning set of size s, I define uh, the smaller partial correlations that are a size one less than s, and I iterate this recursive definition until it terminates with a conditioning set of size one, in which case it's just a function of a bunch of pairwise partial correlations. So the correlation between I and J is just the covariance scaled by the variances. And then I could talk about the correlation between J and K and I and K, and that combines together to give me the partial correlation of I and J given K, and it's a recursive definition, right? So this is a common uh, 
there's common parameter of interests for conditional independence tests and Gaussian settings. And it's easy to obtain estimates of this partial correlation coefficient based on the empirical covariance matrix of some data set. I'm not going to go into it, but it's, there's like lots of um, well-developed software to do this. The nice thing about partial correlations is that um, you can construct a level alpha uh, hypothesis test by using this kind of old trick called the Fisher Z transformation. Z is a function that I can apply to a given partial correlation uh, calculated from a sample of size N uh, that looks like this, like the hyperbolic tangent kind of. Uh, so if I take this transformation of the partial correlation coefficient, you can show that under the null hypothesis that the partial correlation is exactly zero, that thing has a, is asymptotically centered um, at the uh, normal with unit variance. And so I can reject for, for an alpha level test, I can just take that transformed uh, Z transform partial correlation and reject um, in the kind of usual way for a normally distributed test statistic. So if I can calculate this thing well, then I can test this null hypothesis for Gaussian distributions in a kind of simple and straightforward manner. There are similar tests uh, for, for example, for multinomial discrete data using a chi-squared test statistic or also this g-squared test statistic. You can also, for parametric families, use tests based on logistic regression coefficients or odds ratios or whatever you like. Um, Non-parametric tests are much trickier. So non, what I mean by non-parametric tests is ones that make much more minimal distributional assumptions. So they don't assume some nice family like Gaussians or multinomials. Um, and in particular, this is mostly a live question when you have continuous variables, right? Like I wanna uh, uh, do a non-parametric test of con conditional independence in the case where I'm, my variables are, are continuous. Uh, and there's different ways of doing this. One kind of well-known test is based on ideas from uh, kernel regression. So this KCI test is called the kernel-based conditional independence test, um, which is a kind of popular one that uh, places some smoothness and simplicity conditions on the distribution, but that are kind of pretty broad. So like square integrable uh, stuff. And basically just uses a test statistic that's based off of a, a conditional centralized kernel matrix. So basically you're like doing a bunch of kernel regressions, constructing the kernel matrix, taking a test statistic with the trace of this big matrix. And then uh, you can say what the asymptotic distribution of this test statistic is under the null of conditional independence and reject in the kind of uh, normal way. And uh, this is just like a little bit of R code to show like a, a simulation you could run yourself at home to see how well the KCI test works. Um, it's implemented in, for example, this library called conditional independence tests. And so I can, so here I'll, I generate some data where things are non-linear. I have like quadratic terms and so forth. So my linear partial correlation coefficient stuff will, is expected to do poorly. And I can uh, run the, the uh, kernel-based conditional independence test and you'll notice that if you do this, the sample size here is 100 and it works fine. But as soon as you have like very large sample sizes, it becomes very computationally intensive because estimating these kernel matrices and multiplying them together is hard, right? I think it's n, I think it's n to the third in terms of uh, complexity. So it becomes really, really slow to do these kind of non-parametric tests if you have large sample sizes, which is often the case in which you would want to do uh, non-parametric stuff in, in general. So there are other, uh, so this is like one example of a non-parametric conditional independence test that's available. There are other ones uh, kind of recently, one that has um, uh, one proposal that's garnered some attention is this test based on the uh, generalized conditional covariance measure. So this paper by uh, Sean Peters uses a test statistic that's basically a normalized version of this expected conditional covariance. So you can show that under the null hypothesis of conditional independence, this thing should be zero. So this is conditional covariance and the expected value of that, um, where the conditional covariance is defined 
as such. And so you can basically derive a test statistic that involves estimating a bunch of these conditional expectations using a kind of non-parametric regression method of your choice, for example, kernel-based stuff or, or whatever. Um, and under some uh, smoothness conditions, the residuals from that test can be used to construct a test statistic, which has a, uh, you know, asymptotic distribution under the null that you can write down and you could reject the test of level alpha. Yes. I, I think I'm missing something here because the covariance, I always think of as being a deterministic uh, thing. It's like a measure of substitution. So what is the expect? It, it's because it's a conditional covariance. Oh, condi so it's a different awesome. number for every X test. So Great. it's your expectations for XS. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so this is so these examples are just like two kinds of proposals about non-parametric conditional dependence tests that are out there. They involve using non-parametric methods for regression, basically, and combining them in some sort of clever way. And there are other ways you can do this. There are other non-parametric tests available. The thing is that they all have their pros and cons about how restrictive they are in terms of smoothness assumptions they impose, uh, how computationally intensive they are. Um, and, and so forth. And this is a kind of ongoing area of research, uh, better conditional independence tests. Okay, but so then those are the kind of ingredients that you need to do PC. So once you have chosen a test and a way of choosing alpha, the significance threshold, you can run PC and, uh, and your life is good. Um, so the virtues of PC, as I said before, is that it has this kind of non-parametric in principle um, quality in that as I can be as non-parametric as I want to be, or as I'm sort of statistically able to be with non-parametric independence tests, it's relatively scalable in the sense that applications of PC to hundreds of variables are routine. So like thousands of variables are like a little harder, but totally possible. Uh, millions are probably out of reach for PC, but you know, it gets used in, for example, uh, genetics applications um, and then and, uh, and that's kind of nice. There's lots of work on improvements of the classic PC, uh, especially ones that address some of the kind of finite sample stability issues and the order dependence of the tests. Um, and so if you look, dive into this literature and look at PC stable, for example, or um, uh, kernel based PC or some of these other variations, um, there's been you know, a 30 year history of people doing variations on PC. The drawbacks are that uh, because it does a sequence of conditional independence tests and future tests are in part determined by the outcomes of previous tests that errors propagate very poorly. So if I make a mistake, if I falsely remove an edge early on in the procedure uh, that limits what kinds of hypotheses I can test later and that can make a big difference to the output, which can, to some extent, be mitigated by some of these variations, but is fundamentally an issue. It does not handle conflicting statistical information in a very intelligent way. Uh, every implementation of PC has to make some decisions about what to do if statistical conflicts emerge. You know, if like two conditional independence tests, which are mutually incompatible, uh, are both accepted, for example. Um, so different heuristics are, are, are used for that kind of thing. Uh, so be careful about that. It's not that scalable. Uh, it's hard to parallelize uh, as opposed to some other measures, uh, other algorithms which are easier to parallelize. Um, it tackles each problem only locally. So it's only looking at conditional independence between XI, XJ, and some conditioning set uh, kind of individually of each other. Um, rather than thinking about like the global fit of the whole DAG. And, uh, and it only produces one estimated graph, which represents an equivalence class, rather than uh, so what you might desire in some settings, which is like a range of good options. So uh, an alternative approach is to do score-based selection for DAGs. As I said before, score-based procedures view structure learning as an optimization problem. Basically, they assign a score or a measure of fit to every possible structure in the class of structures and find the one with the highest score. That's the question over there. 
Sure. Comment on other versions of PC where you first cluster variables up in, say, like three groups. You know, in the condition that has um, the question is, is there other versions of PC that sort of uh, cluster sets of variables into groups, learn things locally, and then try to combine them later? Uh, not exactly. So there are versions of algorithms that do something like that in the setting where there are um, unmeasured variables. So where the different clusters may partially overlap, but not entirely overlap. And there may be unmeasured confounders which affect different elements of different clusters and so forth. So there is a kind of literature on, on combining local uh, subgraphs into like a union graph, um, but not quite with PC. I don't know, Karen, what's the better? Yeah, so you can also do, you know, learn, just to repeat for people on Zoom, you can also learn first an undirected graph using whatever, like lasso, graphical lasso kind of thing. And that also kind of can help with the stability um, issue. Yep. Uh, so, what kind of score might you consider for a score based approach? A natural score uh, from the Bayesian perspective is the posterior probability of a particular structure given the data. Um, and there's a long history of kind of, uh, not that score-based learning has to have a kind of Bayesian flavor to it, but there's a long history of incorporating Bayesian ideas into structure learning through this kind of score-based paradigm. The idea being that, you know, a more, a a posteriori probable structure uh, is one that sort of fits the data better. And you could imagine searching for the structure which has the highest posterior. So how would you define this in the space of graphs? So thinking about the Bayesian network model, the set of distributions that factorizes according to a graph um, as you know, a combination of a graph and a set of distributions that factorize um, you can sort of rephrase this as a parameterized Bayesian network model where you just have free parameters theta g that depend on what the graph is. Uh, so these are parameters that index distributions in the set of densities that factorize with respect to the graph. And you can define the posterior probability of a structure g given data d by using Bayes rule, which will incorporate a prior probability over graphs the probability of each graph a priori, and something that looks like the marginal likelihood, the probability of the data given a particular graph, which itself is actually something that's like a kind of average over a prior distribution over the parameters, right? So there's actually kind of two priors at play in this version of, of a Bayesian model selection. There's a prior over graphs, P of G, and a prior over the parameters of a given graph. And that's used to calculate the likelihood or the marginal likelihood. Um, and then there's this denominator, which is the probability of D, which is going to be the same for every graph, and you can kind of ignore for the purposes of graph selection. So, uh, so you can follow this kind of reasoning and define a score, which is a function from data and, and graph to a number, which takes a candidate graph and a data set and returns a number proportional to the posterior distribution. So just ignoring that denominator, this would be the Bayesian score. So it's like the log of the posterior probability, ignoring the denominator there. Um, you can even assume that every DAG in this, if you're doing this over the space of DAGs, you can sort of assume that every uh, DAG in the space of graphs has equal prior probability. So this number is just the same for every graph and kind of ignore that to make it easy as a common thing to do. But it's still, even if you'd make that kind of simplifying a uh, prior assumption that still leaves us with trying to evaluate this marginal likelihood. So it still involves for each particular graph, some sort of prior distribution over the parameters. And this is pretty difficult to calculate outside of special cases. So there's like a, a, a long history of work in, especially in the early nineties about how to evaluate uh, the marginal likelihood for special classes of graphs and distributions, for example, DAGs with binary variables or Gaussian variables, um, which kind of depends on 
choosing a conjugate prior for the probability of theta given G um, in a way such that the marginal likelihood is kind of easy to calculate through that integral. So as an example, if you choose a prior that's uh, Dirichlet over theta, then uh, you can show that the marginal likelihood has a kind of uh, easy form. And there's a few other convenient choices like this, but in general, uh, that's a hard thing to do and hard to adapt to kind of different circumstances. So I think it's much more common to instead use an approximation to the marginal likelihood that doesn't require specifying a whole bunch of prior stuff, uh, in particular using the BIC score, the Bayesian information criterion. So for distributions in the exponential family, the BIC score is an approximation to the marginal likelihood uh, under some very weak assumptions about the prior. In particular, you can show that the log of the marginal likelihood is approximately like the uh, log likelihood of the data where I plug in the MLE estimate for theta minus a complexity penalty where D is the dimension of the graph, the number of free parameters that you have to estimate and log N is log of the sample size plus something that's O1. So, so that means that I can effectively approximate this uh, marginal likelihood by doing maximum likelihood for whatever parametric family I'm working in, plugging in the MLE and then penalizing it in an appropriate way. And that asymptotically, that's the same as maximizing the marginal likelihood. So uh, this is a kind of, and so, Asymptotically maximizing the marginal likelihood is kind of the same as asymptotically maximizing the posterior probability if I assume an equal prior over all possible graphs. And so then people just use that thing itself as the score. So basically saying the score is the likelihood evaluated at the MLE minus this penalty. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it's great for more specific about the finding all the set of graphs that I want to consider. Uh, like the number of potential graphs that I can consider can be exponential, but how should I think it narrowly drawn so that I can understand it? Yeah, so the question is how should how should one think of the space of possible graphs that you're willing to consider? So I think it's worth separating like the space of possible graphs that you're willing to consider as like possible, you know, your hypothesis class to sort of put it in the machine learning way. Um, versus how you might traverse that space, like search over that space. So the space of possible graphs might be uh, in this setting, like the space of DAGs or the space of CP DAGs, the equivalence classes of DAGs. So for every CP DAG, I want to be able to assign it a score. And I'm searching over the space of CP DAGs. And then how to traverse that space is what we're going to get to next, which is usually using a greedy algorithm. It doesn't require that you actually list all. The, I mean, obviously, the brute force approach would be list all the possible CP DAGs over P variables, which is just kind of impossible to do. So instead, we're going to do a kind of greedy approach to the space of CP DAGs. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's in two slides. Let me get to that in one second. So the interpretation, I just want to say that the interpretation here is, I guess, from a Bayesian perspective, kind of assuming a uniform prior over graphical structures and some sort of smooth prior over parameters, and then maximizing the BIC score is kind of like doing uh, maximum a posteriori inference. Okay? That's the Bayesian interpretation. But alternatively, you can do this without thinking about posteriors and just thinking of the BIC score as some measure of model fit, which is a kind of penalized maximum likelihood estimate. And so the second term penalizes the maximum likelihood estimate in a way that's uh, proportional to the complexity, but that decays with n as log n. So uh, why do you want to do this? So if I didn't penalize it at all, I could just imagine picking graphs based on their MLE estimates of the parameters, but this will lead me to overfit. I can always get a better likelihood by just including more parameters, basically including a more dense graph and letting those parameters be like close to zero, things are close to vanishing. And so if I didn't penalize this 
likelihood in some way, I'm going to always fit a too dense graph. So I won't have consistency if the truth is potentially sparse. So you need some sort of uh, simplicity penalty. Um, but uh, which penalty in particular comes from these kind of asymptotic arguments about consistency? So this particular sparsity penalty of BIC is proportional to D thing. Um, you can show, and there's like papers by Schwartz and then paper by Houghton in 1988, that for at least for exponential families, makes the score consistent. So asymptotically, you're, you're going to select the true model regardless of the true complexity. And other penalties you might come up with do not come with that guarantee. In particular, the AIC criterion, which gives you a penalty that's independent of N, is not, you know, it might be useful for other purposes, like selecting a model with good predictive qualities or whatever, but it's not going to be consistent. Uh, it's not asymptotically going to select the best model. So, uh, so the I guess the kind of hand wavy answer is that if you read uh, the paper by Houghton from 1988, you see that like changes to this complexity term uh, that don't let it decay appropriately with sample size uh, will ruin kind of consistency guarantees. Um, you can multiply this penalty term by any fixed constant greater than zero and still get consistency though. So that part uh, is kind of free. There's a question there. Yeah. So is D the number of parameters with respect to a fixed graph G? So yes. why, if that's the case, why do you say that D controls the sparsity of the graph? Because it's sort of uh, for, um, for different candidate graphs, it's going to penalize the likelihood more or less, right? So if I, if I compare two graphs, one that has more edges and so more parameters to estimate, it's gonna give you a larger penalty, a larger sort of subtraction term compared to the, the, the likelihood term as compared to a, a more sparse graph that has a smaller D. But like the likelihood, those two graphs might have the same likelihood approximately, the sparse graph and the dense graph, but the dense graph will have a lower score because it's penalized more. That makes sense. Uh, I think you have it. Just a very quick clarification. What precisely is the way you can take when you say substitution model and n to infinity, so sample size to infinity, with a fixed p infinity. Question from Zoom: Should there be a graph that controls the weight of the complex model penalty, um, so that we can manually select more complex or simple models? Why is it that's happening here? Uh, so this is the, yeah. So could you? But that's kind of what I was just trying to say is that the asymptotic consistency argument holds for any. You can add like a lambda, which is a positive coefficient in front of d over log n, and then you still get the same asymptotic behavior. But this is the kind of form that you get from the original BIC score as an approximation to the marginal likelihood. Yeah. So, so D is a number of edges in the graph? D is the number of parameters in the graph, which for simple graph classes is basically the number of edges, yes. So it depends if you, so uh, like say you're thinking about a linear model, then it's like every edge has a parameter, and but then maybe it's two because you have variances for each model unless you standardize the variances. So I'm leaving it kind of open for here, but it's whatever the dimension is of the model. So how, how is it different from this um, P of G that you totally just removed? The P of G? This? Yes. So P of G is a prior over every possible graph in the space. So say I'm in some space of bold face G and each script G is some graph in that space. So if I assume that they're all the same, then it's just a constant here. So I'm not incorporating any prior P of G when I do the BIC score thing, but in order to interpret it as a maximization of the posterior, you have to assume that this thing is a constant. Otherwise, I would have to find a different score for every, I would have to sort of weight the score by the prior graph, prior on over graphs as well. But you could do, you could, you could use a version of this VIC score that also had a term that penalized a priori unlikely graphs more and upvoted a priori likely graphs 
uh, differentially. But here it doesn't doesn't incorporate any prior over graphs. Right. But a D log n is kind of already penalizing certain graphs, right? It's penalizing graphs just based on the complexity. But like I could have multiple graphs of the same complexity that are sort of treated the same here. Whereas if I record the variables prior, they can be on different planets. The fact that choosing the probabilities solution that this is the fact that choosing the probability distribution over that graph. Theta is the parameters associated. So if I imagine like a particular choice of graph, like say I have this graph here as my candidate G, then uh, I'll have like uh, a bunch of a bunch of parameters and maybe the maybe like variance of x1 is theta two is theta three variance of x two is theta four and so on. So theta is the collection of parameters that parameterizes a given graph, which for linear models is like edge coefficients and variances, or for uh, like multinomial models is the cell probability. So it's specifying cell probability that is compatible with other graphs. Yes. Another quick question. Is there an intuitive uh, uh, explanation for the log and? Uh, the explanation for the log n is that the asymptotic arguments for for how much the complexity should trump likelihood comparisons has to decay fast enough. So you you show so in the paper I, I have to go back to the paper, but in Houghton's paper from '88, you can show that the differences between likelihoods for kind of neighboring graphs is going to be uh, similar to log n. So you have to have something that decays at this rate in order to like outweigh the differences between likelihoods for similar graphs. Um, okay, so as an example for a particular parametric family that's very common is, is the multivariate Gaussian. So in that case, the score just ends up being like the maximum likelihood estimate of the covariance matrix, which I'll call sigma hat here, minus this penalty. So I can compare for every candidate graph, I can just derive what the MLE is for that graph for Gaussian, uh, Gaussian data, estimate it, and then penalize it appropriately. So if, if computational limitations weren't an issue, if I really could just like list all the possible graphs, I might do something uh, similar to what we saw before, like list every possible graph in the space that I'm interested in, calculate the score for each one, and pick the graph with the highest score. I'll notice that some graphs will have the same score because if they imply, for example, if they imply the same conditional dependence constraints, then they're all going to apply imply the same uh, covariance matrix in the case of Gaussian graphs, right? Because the covariance matrix is just, just really capturing conditional dependencies in the first place. So they'll have the same uh, likelihood and they'll have the same complexity because we know that Markov equivalent graphs have the same number of edges. So they'll have the same number of free parameters. So they'll have the same likelihood, same complexity, means they'll have the same score. And so, uh, so this is a procedure that I can sort of imagine, but I can't actually carry out and wouldn't be the most efficient thing to carry out. So instead, uh, the kind of, standard approach is to use a greedy score-based algorithm that does stepwise optimization of this BIC score in a way that I don't have to traverse the whole space of graphical structures, but just have to make local moves between neighboring graphs in a way that is still ideally globally optimal. So provably we'll find the optimal scoring graph in the limit as n goes to infinity. And that's what the greedy equivalent search algorithm does. Uh, and it's operating in the space of CP DAGs, uh, equivalence classes of graphs. So as a kind of schematic of how that works, uh, to kind of parallel what we did with PC, imagine just like four variables. So PC started off with a complete graph, right? And started removing edges. GES instead has a forward stage and a backward stage, where the forward stage starts off with the empty graph, it adds edges one at a time to improve the score. 
until it can no longer improve the score by any single edge additions. And then it starts removing edges one at a time to improve the score more. So it'll start off with this empty graph over four variables. It'll ask which single edge, so like the four variables, I could add any one of these edges, right? So there's a bunch of edges I could add. It'll score each possible edge addition and pick the one that has the highest improvement in score. So it makes it greedy. So it'll add the edge, which improves the score the most, add the next edge, which given this previous one, improves the score the most, and so forth, and keep adding edges to improve the score until it achieves a kind of local optimum where it can no longer improve the score by adding single edges anymore. And then it'll start removing edges to try and additionally improve the score. And, uh, and then the kind of another trick that makes it possible to, um, to think of this as consistent in the space of CP DAGs is that at every step, it kind of keeps track of Markov equivalents. So using a few graphical rules, it'll say, well, I'm kind of, it only really considers adding and removing directed edges actually at every step, but it sort of says, well, what are the unshielded colliders in this graph that I just created? And everything else should be unoriented because only the unshielded colliders in the graph I created really have an orientation. And so it kind of keeps track and unorients edges whenever they're not unshielded colliders. So, uh, the pseudocode for GES is like a little harder to parse, but it's, um, let's give it a try, I guess. So, so the overall procedure has a forward search and a backward search. So it starts off with an empty graph. It defines some sort of score, like the BIC score. Um, it does this forward search, and then it starts from the, well, the result of the forward search and does a backward search. So the forward search looks like this kind of thing. Um, where basically you initialize a bunch of empty lists and then you set, you look at every candidate edge between I and J where they're not already adjacent. And uh, you calculate how much, so from the empty score, uh, how much that added edge improves the score with a subroutine that here is called score edge addition. And so you sort of keep a list of how much each thing improves the score. And then you keep it if it improves the score more than any of the other ones in the list. And then you have a step at the end, which looks at some unoriented edges and keeps track of Markov equivalents, but basically just looking at colliders. And the backward stage is just the backwards version of this. It starts off with some graph that you've just learned from the forward stage. And then it iterates through adjacencies and sees how much removing that edge improves the score and keeps the one that improves the score the most. And then keeps track of uh, unoriented edges for Markov equivalents. So each sort of subroutine here is like doing a little bit of work. So you have to decide whether inserting an edge or removing an edge is a valid operation based on respecting the Markov equivalence properties of the graph. So you can just kind of, there's like graphical results based on what's undirected and what's adjacent to what basically uh, to determine whether every particular edge addition or removal is valid. Uh, the score edge addition and score edge deletion, I'm leaving out here, but it's just calculating differences between score of G prime versus G. Um, and then rebuild the step at the end uh, is the one that sort of unorients um, unorientable edges, basically unorients everything that's not an unshielded collider, and then propagates those same rules R1 through R4 that we talked about earlier in PC to orient some stuff that's acyclic. So I didn't include all the subroutines here, this paper. Uh, so the kind of details of the procedure and the proof of its um, correctness is in this paper by uh, Chickering from 2002. Um, uh, actually, this particular formulation of the pseudocode, I was following a paper by uh, Ramsey et al. from 2010 in their appendix. They have it written out nicely. Um, so, but that's basically the whole procedure. It involves a forward search, a backward search. At each stage, it calculates how much the score changes, whether it's valid, and then keeps track of more cool ones. Yes. Uh, 
question from Luke, do G, S, and T, C end up, uh, always end up with the same graph? Um, the question is, do G, S, and T, C end up with the same graph? So asymptotically, since they're both correct and consistent procedures, yes, they should end up with the same graph. In practice, almost certainly not, because uh, data is hard. So like, as, as although, although the procedures are asymptotically kind of equivalent in the sense of returning the same CP DAG, uh, as we said earlier, for PC, when PC makes a mistake, it makes a mistake about a conditional independence test, which then affects future conditional independence tests. When GES makes a mistake, it makes it like falsely adds or falsely removes an edge, right? Um, but a nice thing about GES is it's like a little bit more robust to mistakes than PC because it kind of has two chances, right? If it falsely added an edge, it'll probably remove it in the backwards search. So that's a kind of reason why in a lot of at least small sample settings, GES will perform somewhat better than vanilla PC uh, because it has this kind of second chance to recover from a mistake. Yes. You say there that you get a, a global optimum. That's the case when in the limit of infinite data. Yeah. Does this translate to any optimality guarantees with finite data? Um, so, so the question is about optimality guarantees with finite data. So, similar to PC, you can prove a kind of uniform consistency result for GES, which I'll mention again towards the end of this presentation, which gives you like an error bound for being uh, incorrect about what the ultimate graph is. Um, so I guess in that sense, and so it's, it's a finite sample guarantee, but it's not one that's really like actable on because it's, it's really a limit result that just tells you the rate at which it approaches the truth, but it's not going to give you uh you know like a pack bound or like a here's a sample size and at which i know i'm epsilon away from the global optimum or something like that so the yes um are there are there results for ges or or algorithms like ges that are scored based they say um we have like a constant factor of uh prox approximation maybe on some of functions of the underlying dis distribution? Um, results about constant factor approximation for GES. No, not really as the way that you're saying it, as far as I know. I mean, there. I think the results that there's like, uh, do I have this here? Like the results are kind of similar to PC in the sense that there's like an Oracle result that it tells you with correct, as, the correct imp improvements in the score and stuff are guaranteed to get the right thing. And then there's like asymptotic results that tell you that it converged to the truth as sample size increases. But there's not really anything that tells you how far away you are from the true graph uh, in that way exactly, as far as I know. Um, but let me say, let me summarize a little bit about like similar to what we did with PC. The logic of GES is that um, the high, like we've defined a score such that the highest scoring model will in the limit as n goes to infinity be a member of the true equivalence class or a representation of the true equivalence class. We're adding and removing edges incrementally to improve the score. And, and we're doing this in a way that is surprisingly, I'm gonna to get to this in a second, but surprisingly we'll achieve a global optimum. So like generally greedy stepwise things in statistics are not typically consistent. Like stepwise regression not typically consistent in, in settings that we care about. But sort of like the cleverness of GES in the way that it makes its moves is that you can prove that it will land on the global optimum, at least as, as n goes to infinity. And I'll get to that in a second. And then the last sort of logic bit is keeping track of Markov equivalence uh, to, and, and using the same rules. So uh, let me say a bit more about the score properties. So uh, to, to make greedy search for CPDAGs globally optimal, um, the score we use should satisfy these three abstract properties. And it turns out the BIC score, at least for exponential families, does provably satisfy these three abstract properties. The three properties are consistency, score equivalence, and decomposability. 
So consistency is that the true structure will maximize the score. So that for all graphs that are not the true one, the score for the true one should be higher than the rest. Um, and so that's a property you can sort of see kind of from BIC because it's, it's like Bayesian consistency. It's like, it's approximation to the posterior. The posterior is highest for the truth. And so uh, BIC sort of inherits this kind of thing. Uh, score equivalence is also important. So that it, it scores equally Markov equivalent graphs. This is sort of uh, natural, like kind of satisfied for free for um, certain families of distributions like Gaussians. Um, but you can also define scores that violate this for certain classes of distributions. So, so this is why it's sort of important to think about the exponential family or, or some family in which you're kind of uh, guaranteed to have the score equivalence property. And then finally, decomposability, which says that I can decompose the score of an entire graph into a sum of scores of local pieces of the graph. So we know the joint distribution factorizes as the product of every variable given its parents. And so the score for the graph should basically factorize like the probability or the score of every variable given its parents. So that's what, and this is true again for the BIC score. So these three properties uh, uh, are kind of key to proving the consistency or global optimality of GES. Um, they imply this uh, further property that's kind of uh, worth examining a little bit. It's key to the proof. Um, it's called local consistency, which is the following property. It says that if G is any DAG and G prime is a DAG that results from adding an additional edge between I and J, then the scoring cr criterion is called locally consistent if whenever I and G are not independent, given the parents of J, then the score for the added one should be bigger than the score for the uh, one where that edge is absent, right? So like basically adding the edge should improve the score of probability one. Whereas if they're actually independent, so they're de-separated, then I shouldn't have improved the score, I should have decreased it. That's a kind of local consistency. So um, uh, this is a kind of nice property because it means that single edge score differences, the differences between graphs that just differ by one edge, actually have this kind of correspondence to a conditional independence test. And so I, I alluded to this earlier when I said that score-based methods and constraint-based methods are not that different in a sense because they're, they're, they're both testing conditional independence constraints, but constraint-based methods are looking at conditional independence constraints with hypothesis tests, whereas score-based methods are looking at score comparisons to basically check conditional independence constraints. And so that leads to this kind of result that, um, at least for Gaussian distributions, it kind of works, works out nicely, that if I compare two graphs like that that differ by one edge, that their score difference is just a function of their partial correlation for that adding that edge. So it's just like, Rho is the partial correlation. So it's just like a measure of how dependent I and J are given the parents. And so it's just the score difference just ends up being this, it's like a test statistic that's like related to the partial correlation. And since GES only looks at score differences, um, this is actually kind of nice because it lets you, it leads to some strategies for doing something kind of more semi or non-parametric for GES. Part of the issue with GES is that you're, calculating likelihoods to calculate a score. And that's easy to do for Gaussian data or, or, or multinomial data, but non-parametrically, you kind of want to avoid calculating entire likelihoods. But the nice thing about uh, uh, the score differences formulation is that the score differences kind of really just capture a conditional independence fact. So if you have a non-parametric measure of that conditional independence strength, it kind of, you can use it in place of score differences in a certain way. And this has been used in some recent papers. This one's uh, by Bi Wei Huang uh, that defines a kind of generalized score metric using kernel regression and leads to a kind of more non-parametric formulation of GES. So, so the, these results, these properties lead to this kind of, uh, these kind of theoretical guarantees that um, because the BIC score satisfies uh, these 
free properties. It also satisfies local consistency. And that means that uh, I, can, I can show that assuming the distribution is Markov and faithful to a DAG, then I'll learn the correct CP DAG um, in the limit of infinite sample size. And as a kind of, well, I don't know if I have time for this actually. Um, I'm gonna skip this. So, uh, so the virtues and drawbacks of score-based search are that it's easy to parallelize because you are kind of only looking at score-based single edge differences and in, in like one part of the graph. And so you kind of don't care what's happening in another part of the graph. So you can do these at the same time. So there are parallel implementations of GES, which are super scalable. Um, it's less prone to statistical errors than constraint-based search because of this like ability to, uh, to, to recover from some mistakes. Um, the drawbacks are that, uh, at least in the sort of classic formulation, you need to specify likelihoods. So it's not kind of as straightforward to do non-parametrically as, as PC might be. Um, the results, all these results about BIC score are restricted to exponential families, for example. Um, although there is this kind of active area of non-parametric scores. There's no, uh, people like it because they think they don't need to choose a tuning parameter alpha. I think this is kind of a false sense of comfort because you can sort of choose a family of scores that are all asymptotically equivalent, but are different for finite sample size. As we said earlier, you can multiply the complexity penalty by alpha and it will be a consistent score. So it's kind of nice because in the software, people don't think about that a lot of time, but in, in, in reality, there's also a free parameter there. Um, and then another drawback is that uh, this might not really be true anymore, but it's like kind of harder to prove stuff about greedy search than PC um, because it's sort of more graphical what you're doing at every step. Uh, so, so, but there are results for GES that parallel PC. So what are those, so what are those kind of stronger results that people keep asking about look like? So there's a kind of series of papers that deals with um, uniform consistency results, uh, specifically in high dimensional settings where not only N is growing to infinity sample size, but also P is growing uh, to infinity, but in a way such that P is uh, much, much greater than N. So this, uh, as always in statistics, you're gonna make, you want, if you want stronger guarantees about rates of convergence and things like that, you're gonna need to make stronger assumptions. So the assum uh, at least one version of the assumptions is usually formulated like this. Um, so A1 is the assumption. So because now I'm letting the graph grow as N goes to infinity, that means the graph is sort of indexed by N and the distribution is also indexed by N. Uh, question over there? So just to be sure, uh, what is the uh, identity of which uh, variable? N is the size of the graph? N is the sample size. Okay. In lowercase p is the number of vertices. Okay. So p grows with N. Okay. And each one, each graph then induces some distribution that I'm calling p of Nx. So what's the logic behind this kind of making graph scales with N? Uh, what's the logic behind making a graph scale with N? Um, I'm not the best person to answer that question because it, I, it's called but it's like in high dimensional statistics, the idea is that you want guarantees, like a guarantee for N greater than P when you have P to the order of many thousands and an actual sample size of like a hundred. It's kind of misleading, right? Because you're just sort of saying that eventually my data swamps my, I'm no longer high dimensional. Eventually my data swamps my dimension. But they want to keep that the dimension kind of grows with the data so that I'm high dimensional at every sample size. But you can, uh, you can replace what I, I'm about to say with a fixed P. So that will just change assumption two and everything else just makes P fixed and the same stuff holds. Um, so the first assumption is I'm going to assume that the distribution is Gaussian, although that part is actually not essential um, as long as the tests kind of work out in the right way, asymptotically consistently. I'm going to assume it's also faithful to some DAG G for all sample size. Yes. When you say we can, I, I'm going again back to, to your argumentation. You say I can fix uh, 
alpha equals zero and uh, having a constant size of graph. No, I didn't. I didn't say fixing alpha yet. I just said, I this is a result that's a, the results on the next slide, but it's going to let n go to infinity and p go to infinity. So how a sub case of that is where p does not go into infinity and only n goes to infinity. But in that case, p would not be. Yeah. yeah, that would be the classical result. Oh, okay. yes. So in this case, I'm going to allow that the dimension grows with n, but like polynomial in the, in the size of the sample. Um, I'm going to require that there's a fixed, uh, or not fixed, but there's a maximum number of neighbors in the graph uh, Gn that, so this is like Qn is the maximal size of the adjacency set for any vertex. Uh, and I'm allowing it to grow with n, but also polynomial. And then the last assumption is uh, that the partial correlations, or if you're doing a kind of non-Gaussian version of this, whatever measure of dependence you're interested in, in testing, should be bounded from below and above. So all non-zero partial correlations have to be Cn away from zero. So that means you can't have stuff that's arbitrarily close to zero. And partial correlations have to be bounded away from one. And that's just actually, that part is common to pretty much all conditional dependence tests. But this part, this like bounding partial correlations away from zero, that's a strong assumption. Right? So, that, so together, this infimum over partial correlations with the faithfulness assumption is sometimes called strong faithfulness because it's sort of ruling out almost unfaithful distributions. So you can't be arbitrarily close to unfaithful if you make this assumption. And under, under that set of assumptions, uh, just thinking about PC with the Fisher Z test of conditional independence, you get the following kind of result. Um, if C hat is the output of PC, then there is a sequence of alphas. So alpha is going to have to shrink to zero with sample size, such that the probability of of uh, being correct is uh, going to one, and this is the rate for some choice of constant C. Um, in particular, you can show that if you choose the alpha rate to shrink at this particular uh, at this particular rate, which depends on the sample size and that minimum partial correlation size, uh, then you can calculate. You can show that this this. Uh, this equality holds, and you can calculate a kind of loose bound on the error, on the probability that C hat is not equal to C. And similar res results exist for a wider range of distributions, uh, especially kind of these semi-parametric families or Gaussian copulas that kind of use a general version of partial correlation to do their tests. Um, so as, sort of as long as you have a statistical test that satisfies certain properties, you can get this kind of result for PC. Um, uh, I can give you like a really rough sketch of how the proof looks for this kind of thing. This is not an actual proof, but sort of what the ingredients are. So the ingredients are first, like if you think about, um, so when I do PC, I'm doing a bunch of conditional independence tests with larger and larger cardinality of the conditioning set. So let M be the maximum size of that conditioning set. Like M is the largest number of variables I have to condition on in the course of PC and let that vary with N. Then, then I'm sort of, I'm actually gonna analyze a version of the algorithm that's called like PC indexed with a maximum sample, maximum conditioning set size MN. Uh, and then later make a separate argument that that's gonna to converge to the regular PC. Um, let E, I, J give an S to note the event that an error occurs when testing a particular conditional independence hypothesis. So that row ij given s is equal to zero. Then the probability of an error occurring in PC is uh, the bounded by the probability of any error occurring for any test. And then the union bound says that that's something that looks like um, O p to the m. Uh, so it's like I'm bounding the number of tests that I have to perform. And then I have the worst case probability of any test being wrong. And then it kind of appeals to a couple of results about the consistency properties of conditional independence tests, namely that there's two ways that a test can go wrong. You can have a type one error or a type two error. Uh, 
and some some math leads you to the conclusion that for any ijs the supremum of the probability of an error occurring for of each kind can be bounded by an expression that looks like this for some choice of constants and those bounds together lead you to the probability that an error occurs at all is bounded by this thing which uh so it's something that looks like the number of tests that you do and this exponential thing and depends on the minimum partial correlation size. And um, because we assumed that P grows with N like a polynomial N to A, you get something that looks like this and some other constants around. And so that's the sort of like high level sketch of what you need to establish to prove this kind of consistency result. It's like a bound on the, you know, something that looks like the bound on the number of tests and the probability of an error, a bound on each of the kind of errors that you can make and then combine in those ways. And then there's a final step that I ignore here, but that proving that PC sub M uh, eventually goes to the truth as N goes to infinity as well. So that's how the proof goes. So um, I'll conclude by saying that, so the previous results that I was just presenting is as formulated in this paper by Kalish and Buhlman. Um, the combination of faithfulness and the lower bound on partial correlations, A4 is called strong faithfulness and has been criticized uh, or identified as a strong assumption uh, by Caroline in the back and, and her co-authors in, in a kind of precise sense that those kind of measure zero arguments that people like to make about regular faithfulness don't quite carry over when you start talking about almost unfaithfulness. So you can show that it's kind of the violations of strong faithfulness are dense uh, in a measure theoretic sense. Uh, similar results with somewhat stronger assumptions have been proved for GES, but it's basically the same kind of thing. Um, and that there's a uh, approach, so because of this, the strength of this strong faithfulness assumption, there's an interest in weakening strong faithfulness but in a way that still gets you uniform consistency. And so there's some work that uses a kind of intermediate assumption that's stronger than regular faithfulness, but weaker than strong faithfulness. That's called K triangle faithfulness. And so you can prove a uniform consistent re consistency result for a kind of modified PC uh, under that intermediate assumption. So I'll conclude here since it's noon. And then after lunch, we're gonna talk about uh, unmeasured variables, latent variables, and, and confounding, and how things work in that domain. Just a quick question from Lou um, on application, maybe you want to postpone that. So, is there a set of domains that these methods have been applied to, or that we would like to apply them to? Do they seem to work well? Are they used as part of the larger pipeline? Are there domains where we don't mm -hmm. expect them to work so well? Maybe you want to take the data. Um, yeah, that's a complicated multi-part question, I guess. I mean, I'd say very briefly, the domains in which um, the procedures or versions of them have been applied so far in ways that are promising at least are usually in genetics or in neuroscience. So high dimensional settings where you have a large number of variables, whether those are gene expressions or regions of interest in the brain and maybe some other parts of computational biology like protein level uh, stuff. Uh, but in terms of whether we want them to be applied, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. And I can talk more about applications later on. Also, just another brief question is, what's the relationship between minimality, faithfulness, and something like frugality? Do you want to say anything about that? Um, uh, I don't know if I remember the formal results off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure Markov plus, is it Markov plus minimality? Yeah. So minimality is weaker than faithfulness by itself. I don't remember, there's like some relationship that maybe other people in this room remember about how you can prove uh, the stronger from, from a combination of weaker things, but um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Thank you for uh, reconvening at 2 p.m. And I guess today you're on your own for your lunch.
I just want to say one other thing uh, about tomorrow so that you can think about how you're going to handle it for tomorrow already. Tomorrow, the day is going to be screened online. Thomas is going to uh, not be here in person. We'll have the screen here with the presentation. I will certainly be here. You can log on to uh, the screen from home if that's what you would prefer. I, of course, would like to see you here. I think it's nice. The coffee will be there. The breaks will be there. The chats will be there in, the, in between. But the actual lecture will be all online tomorrow. Okay, but uh, the room will be open. We'll run it here. We, I'll say this again at the end of the second section. So maybe you want to talk to each other if you have an option. See you at the